Good morning. Dean Gresham, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Members of the faculty and staff of the University of Mississippi Law School, and to the graduating class of 2014, parents, family, and friends, I must tell you, from the bottom of my heart, it is a great honor to be standing here with you today on this important occasion. If someone had told me many years ago, when I first came to Mississippi, 21 years old, had all of my hair, a few pounds lighter, in 1961 on the Freedom Rise, that I would be standing here today, I would say, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm so pleased and so happy to be here. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to each and every one of you receiving a degree, congratulations. This is your day, and you should enjoy it. Celebrate it. You deserve it. But when the parties are over, and the candles are all blown out, the world will be waiting for you to take it to a better place. As graduate of Ole Miss Law, you can play a powerful role in building a better nation and a better world. Sometime in my travel around the country, people ask me about the current state of civil rights and social justice in America. I guess we have accepted the fact that we don't live in a post-racial society and that we still have much more work to do. But we've made a lot of progress since I was a young boy growing up on a farm outside of a little town called Troy in rural Alabama. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, how many of you remember when you was four? What happened to the rest of us? My father had saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family is still on that land today in rural Alabama. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and coin, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. It was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could. I know a lot of you here in the state of Mississippi know all about Kentucky Fried, or Popeyes, churches, Chick-fil-A. But you don't know anything about raising chickens. As a little boy, I would take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. And some of you may be asking, John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more eggs. You had to be able to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? It's okay you don't follow me. But these little chick would hatch. I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. I'd put them in a box with a lantern and raise them on their own. Get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, and place them under the setting hen, encourage the setting hen. They're still in the nest for another three weeks. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most democratic thing to do, but I never could save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive hatcher or incubator from the Susan Roebuck store, so I just kept on cheating on the setting hen. Are most of you old enough to remember the Susan Roebuck catalog? That big book? That thick book? That heavy book? Some people call it the ordering book. 
Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. So I just kept on wishing. As a little boy, about 10 and 11 years old, I wanted to be a minister. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and cousins would line the outside of the chicken yard, but they helped make up the audience, the congregation, and I would start speaking or preaching. And when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I am convinced that the great majority of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Well, that's enough of that. Today, on this day, I just want to tell you a story or two. When I would visit the little town of Troy, when I would visit Montgomery, when I would visit Birmingham, I saw signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would ask my mother, ask my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But one day in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on our radio. The words of Dr. King, the action of Rosa Parks inspired me to find a way to get in the way. With some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the little town of Troy in 1956 to the public library, trying to check out some books, trying to get library cards. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to the Pike County Public Library until July 5th, 1998, for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. And hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up, signed a lot of books, had a wonderful reception, the ending of the book signing, the ending of the reception, they gave me a library card. That may not sound that important, but when people tell me nothing has changed in Mississippi, changed in American South, I said, come and walk in my shoes. This state is a different state. Our region is a different region, and we are a better people, and we are on our way to land down the burden of division, the burden of separation. We are on our way toward the creation of the beloved community. And I say to you, young graduates, young lawyers, you must find a way to get in the way, to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. That is your moral obligation. That is your responsibility. You don't have a right to be silent. You must speak up. You must speak out and bring justice and fairness to our region, to our country, and to the world community. That is your calling. Yes, if someone had told me that one day a young barefooted boy growing up poor in rural Alabama one day have an opportunity to serve in the United States House of Representatives, representing the good people of Georgia for almost 28 years. It can happen. As lawyers, you must make a way out of no way. Yes, you must get in the way. You can do it. You have been trained, you've learned from the best. You've got to give back. Just don't do just do well, do good. Be brave, be bold, be courageous, and never ever give up. Never ever give in. 
Never ever give out. Keep the faith. Hold on. And keep your eyes on the prize. This is your day. Thank you for being you. Thank your parents, your husband, your wives, your sisters and your brothers. Thank your dean. Thank your professors. I know it's been hard for some of you. My mother used to tell me when I was out there working in the field, she said, boy, you're not keeping up. I said, well, this is hard work, and it's about to kill me. She said, boy, hard work never kill anybody. Keep on, press on, get involved. Forget about your own circumstances and get involved in the circumstances of others. Not just here on this little piece of real estate that we call America. Not just in the state of Mississippi or in the South, but around our world. And follow the way of peace. Follow the way of love. Follow the way of nonviolence. I was beaten, left bloody, unconscious during the freedom ride. Had a concussion on a bridge in Selma. But I'm not bitter, I'm not hostile. I believe we can redeem the soul of America and create the beloved community. I'll tell you one little story and I'll be finished. Of course, it's not about me, it's about you. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Seneva. And my aunt Seneva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know here in Oxford, here at Ole Miss, here in the state of Mississippi, here in the American South, you never seen a shotgun house. You don't even know what I'm talking about. My aunt Seneva didn't have a green manicured lawn. It's a beautiful lawn. It's beautiful here. She had a dirt yard. In this old shotgun house, sometime at night, you can look up through the roof, through the tin roof, and count the stars. When it was rain, should we get a pail, a bucket, or a tub and catch the rainwater? From time to time, she would walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and put these branches together, tie these branches together, and make a broom. And she called that broom the breast broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard very clean, sometimes two and three times a week, but especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted the dirt yard to look good during the weekend. But those of you who may not know what a shotgun house is, in the nonviolent sense, it's an old house, one way in, one way out, where you can bounce a basketball through the front door, and it will go straight out the back door. But one Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, were I playing in my unseen evil dirt yard. And an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing. My aunt Seneva became terrified. She started crying. She thought the house was going to blow away. She got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands. And we did as we were told, and we all cried. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, my aunt had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that corner. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. Call it a house of old mess. Call it the house of Mississippi. Call it the house of Georgia. Call it the house of New York or California or Texas. We all live in the same house. Not just the American house, but the world house. So it doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We are one people, we are one family, we all live in the same house. 
and we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, as Dr. King said, that we will perish as fools. Go out there, use the law as an instrument, use it as a tool to bring about a nonviolent revolution, a revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. You can do it on your time, on your watch. You must do it. Thank you very much.